Our next speaker is Manuel Del Pina, University of Bath, United Kingdom. Please, Manuel. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the for the invitation. It is an honor for me to participate in this celebration of uh, Olga Ladisenskaya. Um, okay. Today I will I will speak about um, solutions with highly concentrated vorticities in two and three dimensional Euler flows. I will uh, show you some results on this direction. Um, okay, so the, uh, the Euler equation expressing vorticity form <clears throat> for an incompressible flow is uh, this equation that I will call V in, in what follows. So it's a, it's a transport equation with, um, with potential driven by the Newtonian potential of the unknown, which is the vorticity. So by so Laplace and inverse, I mean the Newtonian potential in what follows. And sorry. Okay, and the velocity field, if you want to recover the usual form for the, for the, for the model, is simply the gradient uh, perpendicular of the of the um, of the Newtonian potential given by this formula. So vorticity, by definition, is actually the curl of the velocity field, which is can be identified with a scalar, which is this number. Okay, so um, for this problem, many things are known. So I'm um, classical in the in the PD literature. Um, one of them is the uh, well posedness of this problem in L infinity. So, for if you consider uh, an initial condition uh, which is bounded, okay, and in, and in L1, but perhaps we, we could add that in entire space, then, um, then we have uh, the existence of a bounded solution for all defined at all times, okay. As a matter of fact, if you start with, with an initial condition, which is, which is smooth, the solution actually remains smooth at all times in addition. So this uh, comes uh, from the classical results by Wolitner and uh, more recently and complete the results by Yudovich. Um, just a simple remark, uh, however important for the two dimensional case is that if you consider the solution, of a semi-linear elliptic PDE of this form, where f is an arbitrary nonlinearity, okay, say any function of class C1, then, um, then uh, a solution of this problem inherits automatically a steady state of uh, problem V. Okay, by a solution of this, I mean anyway that psi is inverse Laplacian on the right hand side. So with, with that conversion, then the um, um, omega of x given by f of psi of x, where psi is the solution, is a steady state. So this follows immediately from computing this term up here. The gradient of f of psi is a prime of psi times gradient of psi. So automatically that term is also going to gradient per psi, of course. Okay. Um, so there are many well-known classical examples uh, that, uh, that, that appear in applications. Uh, one of them is the so-called Kaufmann's Cooley vortex. The Kaufmann's Cooley vortex uh, is, uh, is this radially symmetric function. Yeah, and uh, this radially symmetric function is actually the solution of the Liouville equation. And as it is well-known, the mass of, um, of this solution is say pi. So psi is simply the log of this uh, right-hand side. Okay, so what I am uh, interested in this talk are solutions with highly concentrated vorticity. So what do I mean by, by that? Um, I mean uh, solutions that have, whose vorticities are concentrated around a finite number of points which evolve in time. So say the solution then will look like um, a linear combination of direct deltas centered at a finite number of points. This form is more or less natural because uh, if you start with, a, with an initial condition 
uh, which is in L1, okay, and regular at least, uh, the mass is preserving time. So this is what uh, suggests that these numbers shouldn't depend on time, okay? I simply normalize them in the form A pi kappa j for, because it is convenient for me for later purpose. Uh, of course, the um, stream function, psi is called the stream function, is the inverse Laplacian of the Dirac delta. So it's simply the linear combi the corresponding linear combination of, the, of fundamental solutions as indicated here. Okay, so I am interested, what we are interested in here is in describing the dynamics of, um, of solutions with highly concentrated vorticity so that is when some parameter reaches a singular limit, so you will see these guys. Okay, so Excuse the... Me, uh, Manuel, uh, uh, do you uh, assume that kj, uh, kappa j are uh, 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 integer or arbitrary? Uh, no, these are just arbitrary real numbers. So there's okay, no, no arbitrary assumption on them. It is not, it is not necessary. Hmm? Thank you. The, the intensity of the, of the vortices. Okay, so uh, the mathematical theory of these, uh, of, of this, of these things, um, it has actually a very long history. It starts with Helmholtz, so it's actually very old in mid of the 19th century, uh, followed by works of many people, among them Kirchhoff. And uh, well, as a consequence of what I am of, of, of the works of, of, uh, of these people, is that it has been derived in entire space and also in bounded domains. Um, the dynamics of these centers, psi, psi j of t, okay? So um, let me use the following notation. I will call omega s, the s stands for singular. This linear combination of direct delta starts at point psi j of t. And I will call psi s of x t, the corresponding um, fundamental solutions, combination of fundamental solutions as indicated here. Then formally, what we, what we find is that the Euler equation is uh, satisfied if and only if this guy up here is zero. Of course, this is a very singular object. If you differentiate the linear combination of Dirac deltas, you obtain this expression here. And if you plug in the corresponding sums for omega s and psi s, you find this thing here, okay? In the distributional sense, these objects in principle are not well defined if i is equal to j because both of them are singular. And this is a distribution uh, supported at the point psi j. Then, uh, however, um, we have um, we can we can use the the following logic in order to simply ignore those terms. Um, the reason is that you can think of the Dirac delta as a limit of radially symmetric functions because delta itself is a radially symmetric function of its arguments, say, it's, it's invariant under rotations. And the same happens with the fundamental solution. And if you consider gradient of a radial function multiplied by gradient perp of, a, of another radial function, so that's automatically zero, okay? Uh, so this is why we say that the equation is formally satisfied if and only if each of these coefficients, when you evaluate them at x equals psi j, these, are, these distributions are only supported at the point psi j, then is equal to zero. And that amounts to um, having this system of differential equations solved. This is an embodied type problem for a logarithmic potential in the plane. Mm -hmm. This is a Hamiltonian system, uh, which, which uh, from now on I will call k. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, this is our system. The, the, the question, so a natural question is, well, do these uh, solutions of the ODE uh, really represent uh, true solutions of the, Euler, of the Euler system, solutions in the classical sense, okay? So it's more solutions. Um, and uh, this is the question that I would like to address, okay? So the question is the following. Are there true solutions of the Euler equation in vorticity form so that the vorticities are highly concentrated around uh, points 
uh, driven by this um, by this uh, differential uh, equation. Okay. In order to, to address that, I let me let me observe the following first. Okay. I will continue use, to use the notation omega s and psi s to, to for the formal vorticity and for the formal uh, swing function. And uh, I will uh, propose the following regularization of the Dirac deltas. I will simply consider a scaled uh, fixed bell-shaped function, omega zero, and scale in this form. So I, 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 I translate the, uh, I simply divide by epsilon the argument, okay? And correspond, correspondingly, in order to preserve the mass, I multiply that by a factor one over epsilon squared. I am in 2D. So the mass of D is independent of epsilon for a fixed function W0. And I will use W0 as the, um, as the Kaufman Schooly vortex that I referred before, which is this function that decays by as one over y to power. Well, anyway, so this, uh, this regularization of the, of, of the singular vorticity uh, actually takes uh, for the um, for the corresponding uh, string function, which is the inverse Laplacian of this guy, it takes a very simple form. So it is directly the log of someone, and uh, the log, say this singular log, log here, is simply desingularized by uh, x minus the point square plus epsilon square. So that's that's it. So this is this is a very simple um, uh, situation. So we have that the inverse Laplacian of this omega zero epsilon, so which is the, the omega singular regularized, is phi zero epsilon. And the integral of omega zero, uh, as a matter of fact, is a pi. This is a direct computation. Uh, and we have the following fact. Of course, if epsilon goes to zero in this expression, then you arrive to the corresponding linear combination of Dirac deltas, but given by this. And in addition, anyway, we, we also have this uh, uh, observation for the corresponding kinetic energy, or, or say, of, of the candidate for kinetic energy, I, so, I, I, I should say, the great, which is the gradient pair of the stream function, psi. Uh, and uh, what happens is that if you normalize this guy by dividing by log epsilon, then uh, that amount um, goes to the corresponding combination of Dirac deltas, okay? Okay, so um, a result that we have found a, a couple of years ago was the following. Um, we proved that if you start from a solution without collisions, we take this uh, as an assumption for simplicity. So uh, say the regime of collisions is something different and it should be analyzed um, uh, in another way that uh, from what I, I am saying here. Okay, what we prove is that if you start from a collisionless solution of the system K, then there is a solution V, a, a solution of the, of the Euler equation that differs little from this psi zero epsilon omega S zero epsilon centered at the solution, okay? This is the bottom line. So what I am looking for are true solutions of the Euler equation uh, that look like this, okay? like uh, these copies of the, the of the of the corresponding bubble generated by omega zero. Okay, so this is what I am looking for. So, uh, so this is a um, result um, which which is a joint work with uh, Juan Davila uh, and Monica Musso from University of Bath and Jun Ching Wei uh, from UBC Vancouver. And uh, states then as, as follows, say a little bit more precise. If we start with from a collisionless solution of the system K, yeah, defined in a fixed interval zero D, okay? Then there exists a solution, uh, omega, omega epsilon, psi epsilon, not omega zero epsilon, omega psi zero epsilon, okay? A, a true solution, omega epsilon, psi epsilon of the problem uh, Euler, okay? Uh, that has the following form. Omega epsilon xt is equal to the desingularized Dirac deltas that I showed you before, plus a remainder, okay? And correspondingly, the stream function is 
the, the Psi Epsilon zero, okay, which is this guy, plus a remainder. Okay, what can I say about the remainders? I have uh, these uh, strong uh, estimates hmm? uh, that, uh, that are the following. Uh, think first of the string function. So the string function turns out to be of size epsilon square, so really small compared with the log, right? So the, this at the at the pole is log epsilon, and the remainder is epsilon square, so it's really very concentrated. The gradient is less concentrated; it's only size epsilon. And if you take two derivatives, because uh, phi is essentially two derivatives of psi, right? It's the Laplacian of psi of phi. Um, well, I cannot say that the, that um, directly um, uh, uh, something better than uh, one over epsilon in size. Okay, it is this, and we are seeing my number as a matter of fact that we can consider arbitrarily close to one. Okay. All right. So, in particular, what we have is that the um, vorticities approach as epsilon goes to zero naturally, the the singular um, solution, yeah, and the density of the kinetic energy um, approaches the corresponding combination of Dirac delta. Um, let me uh, tell you that there is a previous result. Mm -hmm. uh, do you mean that uh, these solutions exist for all sufficiently small epsilon? Yes, yes. The solutions exist for every sufficiently small epsilon. Okay. You have a solution of this form such that as epsilon goes to zero, it has the 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 form that uh, that the remainders uh, give you give you this. Hmm? Okay, so uh, let me tell you, the, because this is maybe a little subtle point, but, but important. I, the, the number capital T is fixed, and here there are constants, right? So in general, there is a constant C1 and C2 here, I should say. Um, but what happens is that those constants in principle depend on capital T. Okay, So this, these estimates are uniform, but they depend on capital T. It's not that you can let capital T go to infinity. The solution is anyway defined at all times, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so uh, there is, a, as I mentioned, a previous result uh, with a similar statement for the first part, yeah? By Mercurio and Pulvirenti. This, uh, actually they had previous results of the same flavor 10 years before in uh, the case of vortex patches. Uh, they start. They, con they constructed compactly supported solutions that distributionally satisfy this. Uh, however, the, the method is completely different from what I show, and uh, the big difference is that they don't find, uh, as we do, precise asymptotics of the solution near the vortices. So they, they cannot really describe them uh, with their with their approach. So they what they find is. Uh, some control on the size of the support, essentially, rough control, and that allows them to prove that uh, from the weak formulation, as epsilon goes to zero, they find they find this. Okay, the the first part. Okay, so the um, the ingredients on the construction are um, the construction is uh, is uh, technical. However, uh, for us it was. Uh, very interesting, very interesting because it is. Uh, um, we come from a world of singular singularly perturbed problems, but in general, elliptic or parabolic. Okay. Uh, however, uh, the type of methodology that we use apply quite well here, and um, it consists more or less roughly of the following steps. So first, we find an improvement of the approximation in powers of epsilon. Uh, using a combination of elliptical transport equations, which is natural because of the Euler setting. Uh, later, af after we find a sufficiently precise uh, approximation, uh, we set up the problem as a couple system of um, problems that reflect what is happening near the vortices and a guy more regular that uh, that drives what is happening far away from the from the vortices. So the two problems are expressed in different scales, and they correspond to a couple system. Okay, and if 
parameters, in particular, these points, uh, these centers are conveniently chosen, uh, the system becomes solvable. Uh, in fact, weakly coupled. Yes. And uh, that allows us to find a priori estimates that uh, we eventually, uh, that eventually uh, uh, let us solving to, uh, the, the, the equation using a Leray Schauder degree algebra. So, uh, concerning the step of the improvement of approximation, um, let, me, let me give you a flavor of why this works. Okay. So, if you start with, with this function gamma zero, which is the solution of the Kaufman Scully vortex, the string function for the Kaufman Scully vortex, then psi zero epsilon can be written as, the, as this corresponding. Um, linear combination, okay? And um, modified, uh, however, with uh, this constant. Mm? I, will, I will consider it, um, in fact, modified with this constant. And um, now the equation that we want to solve is the, uh, this E of omega psi equals zero, where E is this operator, right? Where psi is sim simply inverse Laplacian of omega. So I will re-express the problem in terms of this variable for a fixed j. So locally around one of these points i j, what I look for is a solution of the full problem that has the form this psi zero epsilon plus a function that naturally I express in terms of this variable x minus i j over epsilon. I call that variable y, okay? So, and I even use this constant just for, it's this cosmetics, but, uh, but, but nice anyway. So I, I let psi to be a perturbation of this form. And for the vorticity, I consider the bubble, the, the J's bubble, which is expressed in the same variable Y, plus a function of the same form, one over epsilon squared times a phi of Y and phi. Okay, in terms of the Y variable, uh, so we get the uh, following expression, yeah? So if you multiply by epsilon to power four, you get this, this, uh, this nice operator. So inverse Laplacian of the remainder psi is phi. Okay? So this is in agreement with, with what we um, want to do. And uh, the phi t guy comes multiplied by epsilon squared because of this epsilon to power four. And uh, I get the transport term that has this form now, omega zero plus phi. And that comes multiplied by this factor, okay. So what happens is that um, this factor is, uh, if you take phi equals zero, is the first order error, okay? It's the first order error that's gonna be gradient of omega zero times this. This term has an epsilon in front. So typically, if you don't assume anything about the point size zero, okay? This term is of size epsilon, if you make this psi equal to zero correspondingly. Okay, however, since we are assuming that the system of differential equations K is being satisfied at main order, then it turns out that uh, the term of order epsilon is uh, eliminated, okay? And the error is improved automatically uh, to have size epsilon squared. And um, more precisely, so this guy, this plus this, okay, um, is, uh, is equal to is equal to this quantity, yeah? where r is now size epsilon square, not not epsilon. Okay, the r this remainder r is like epsilon square y square. Okay, so um, in other words, then uh, the error uh, can be can be the equation can be expressed in this form. Yeah, where the, where this guy is now epsilon square r square. Now, if I let f of u equal e to power u. I can re-express the problem in terms of phi in this form. So you have this operator, phi t times epsilon square plus gradient of gamma zero times this linear operator in psi. Psi, remember, recall, please, is the inverse Laplacian of phi, okay? So this linear operator is the linearization of the Euler equation around the kaufmann scully vortex, yeah? It's the linearized operator. You have this lower order um, operators here, so I, I, I will, for the moment, assume this, uh, they, they are smaller, okay? This is even quadratic, right? In psi and fifth, yeah? And this guy is size epsilon square. 
as a matter of fact, if you compute the error, the main term in the error, which is this guy, yeah, is this gradient per of r times gradient omega zero. Uh, sorry, I call it u zero is omega zero. Yeah, uh, and this is of size epsilon square divided by y to power four. So it decays in y in that form. So we obtain a reduction in the error by solving the following elliptic equation. This plus this equal to zero, which amounts to making this plus this guy equal to zero. So the, you get an improvement of the error if we are able to solve this problem. And solving this problem is actually, um, solving this problem specifically is easy. On the other hand, uh, this operator, what you can see here is actually the linearization of the real equation. It's around the, the standard bubble, nothing special. Uh, plus this term epsilon squared divided by y to power four and multiply by this gradient per gamma zero times gradient. This gradient per gamma zero times gradient correspond if you use polar coordinates to derivative in theta, in the theta variable for polar coordinates, multiplied by a coefficient depending on, on, on rho in the polar variable. Okay. So this, this linear operator is not so complicated. However, it's extremely degenerate because if you plug in here any uh, radial function, this is zero, right? So this has a terrible, terribly big kernel. So we cannot really solve the problem if you plug in, uh, if we plug in on the, on the right hand side an arbitrary function, yeah? However, we manage to solve the corresponding problems locally using um, uh, achieving always uh, terms that don't involve right-hand sides that are radial, okay? At least up to order epsilon to power five. Huh? Uh, now, the point is that we need to alternate the use of the improvement with elliptic equations with, uh, the, um, with, uh, with, the transp with the corresponding transport equation if we, if, we, if we insist on doing that, okay? Sufficient number of times we end up with an error of size epsilon to power five times rho to minus three. And uh, at main order, the problem becomes this one, where this is a quadratic term, okay? Now, on the other hand, why epsilon to power five? The, the, the reason is, uh, is simple. In, imagine that this was epsilon to power four. Only. If this was epsilon to power four, then, and imagine that you solve this equation by just solving the first part, epsilon square phi t. Epsilon square phi t equal epsilon to power four, say, if you divide by epsilon square when you solve, right? Because you just integrate in time. Then you get epsilon squared for the phi. And if you plug in uh, that, that uh, quantity here, you get a new error, which is epsilon to power four, which is the same as you started with. This is why this starts looking better, okay, when, when we have uh, uh, power five. Now, the decay is very important. If you just solve elliptic equations, you gain epsilons, but you lose decay. Huh? So this is why we need to use as the transport terms as well. Okay. Um, uh, uh, you, and uh, uh, why? Uh, pardon. What is rho uh, there? Ah, rho, rho. Sorry. So rho, rho is absolute value of y. Okay. It's, okay. it's, it's, a, it's just absolute value of the of the. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Of the space variable. Okay, so um, so uh, this uh, uh, we need uh, we need sufficient decay to to find good a priori estimates for the linearized equation. For the linearized problem, we get something which is very similar to what you would obtain by simply integrating in time. Forgetting this transport part, if you put epsilon square phi d equals e, then you have one over epsilon square times some integral of e, right? That preserves the space decay. Um, and, uh, and what you get for the full problem, if you assume, however, this is very important, these two conditions, center of mass equal to zero in a very large ball and mass equal to zero. Okay, if you assume these two things, you get a nice estimate for phi weighted, L2 estimate weighted, which is uh, this. This is a key element. You lose a log, but, but that's not so important. Okay, you lose a log of epsilon to one. As a matter of fact, this is what allows us to use, to find a priori estimates for the nonlinear problems. 
and uh, finally solving the full equation, the full system in a router gluing when we have this uh, situation. Okay, let me mention some related results that we have been uh, fine, um, lately working on. Uh, one corresponds to the generalized surface quasi geostrophic equation, which is, an, which is a problem very similar to the original Euler, okay? However, uh, here we use, instead of inverse Laplacian, we use um, um, the inverse of fractional Laplacian, given, given by the convolution with the corresponding um, fundamental solution of the fractional Laplacian, which is this, yeah? And, um, and then, well, I can ask the same question, right? I mean, can, I, can we find solutions with vorticities highly concentrated around a finite number of points? The answer is yes, but under some conditions, huh? under some conditions. So um, this is a joint work with um, my uh, former postdoc, Antonio Fernandez, who's now in Madrid. Um, so um, we are finding the following result. If you consider it sufficiently close to one, however, you can measure how close it is from one. So it is 0 0.937. This is a constraint that we have at this until this moment. Okay, we, we strongly believe this should this could be improved for to lower it, but we don't know yet how to do it. Okay. So um, what we find is that if you have a collisionless solution, say of T now of this embodied problem, then we can find a solution with vorticities center at those points with this form, where now U0 is this variation of the Kaufman Scully vortex, the fractional Kaufman Scully vortex, if you wish. This guy is actually nothing but the um, corresponding Talenti bubble for the critical, say, Yamabe equation, but in, uh, in the, for the fractional case, okay? This is what it is. Uh, the result looks the same. Uh, maybe, maybe one could be a little disappointed of this constraint, however, for our method so far, it, it is essential. Um, and um, the proof is much harder, actually. It needs, uh, in particular, a lot of effort to make high order improvements of the approximation and to control in the gluing process the non local terms, the, the coupling. The coupling becomes much more subtle. Okay. Uh, by the way, in the case of a traveling pair, uh, so in the case of the particular solution corresponding to two vortices traveling with constant speed, okay, two vortices with opposite sign and same intensities traveling with constant speed, uh, you can find a traveling weight solution actually associated to that problem, which amounts to solving certain elliptic equation. And this is a joint work with, um, with, a, a, with a, also, also with the Davila Muson Wei and also with a, our way away from, from Wuhan, from China. Okay, so when this is a result that is already published, and uh, but the situation is much simpler because it is uh, it is uh, reduces to elliptic equation. Uh, let me tell you a couple of words about the um, about the three dimensional case. Three dimensional case for this type of concentration phenomena is quite open as a matter of fact. Okay, however, the formal dynamics have been discussed by by many people. Uh, it, is, it is something less trivial, okay, than in the than in the planar case. Okay, solutions with vorticity is concentrated near curves. Now is what is relevant in the in the three dimensional case. Here you have two examples. Okay, say a tornado and a and a smoke ring thrown by a by a volcano. No? So uh, the formal filament conjecture. So we are calling that. Uh, uh, is the is the okay is, is the question of finding solutions true solutions behaving by the reduced dynamics the reduced formal dynamics the reduced formal dynamics was the first intuition for them at least for vortex rings was found by Helmholtz and the precise law was uh, found by a student of Levi Civita in the early, early 20th century, 1906, 1904, actually, by the Rios, and later on discussed by Levi Civita a lot of times until 1931. Uh, so I will describe to you what, it, what this is. So the, now the Euler equation in R3 in a string vorticity form is this problem. It has, in addition to the previous uh, things, okay, 
it looks like the previous equation, except for the for this term, okay, which is the vortex stretching, which which is what causes all type of difficulties in 3D. Okay. In addition, the problem is vector valued. Now the corresponding string function has uh, has this form. Huh? This is this is the form it takes now. Now, okay. Then um, what we want to find are solutions with vorticities concentrated at the time evolving curve gamma of t parameterized by r class. Okay. I can tell you what uh, what what uh, what we find what, what it is found formally. Okay already originally by the Rios. What, uh, what the Rios found was that if he makes scaling of time, okay, time t actually scale by this factor log epsilon, making a faster variable, yeah? Then the uh, parametrization by arc length of gamma of, of gamma of tau, which is the limiting curve, okay? Yeah, um, takes this form. So it solves this uh, system of differential equations. This is a geometric law, okay? It's a geometric law for the evolution of curves that has a name. It is called the binormal flow of curves, okay? So uh, roughly speaking, the solution evolves along its binormal vector with an intensity with the velocity proportional to the curvature of the, uh, at that point. So the corresponding version of this with the normal vector more. is what is called the, the vortex minutes. stretching. Yes? Three minutes. Yes. Uh, okay. So this is the binormal flow of curves. Hmm? Okay, so the vortex filament conjecture states the existence of a solution of this form. Yeah, that after scaling the in 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 time, you get uh, this approach to the Dirac delta along the curve times the tangent vector field. So this statement is only known for special curves associated to traveling wave solutions. And these are the cases of a thin vortex ring. This was first found by Frankel in the 70s. And more recently, a helicoidal filament. The, heli the case of a helicoidal filament and this case lead to traveling wave solutions, okay? Which, 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 which is the case of, at the end, elliptic equations. If you consider the, the, you know, this kind of clever change of variables for the, to, to take into account the, the helicoidal symmetry inherited by the Euler system, the problem reduces to, to this transport, to this type of transport with this funny matrix here. And the problem of rotating solitons or rotating helicoidal solutions uh, reduces to an elliptic problem uh, which we are able, for which we are able to find nice solutions, say essentially proving the vortex filament conjecture for the case of the helix, okay? A special case. This is a recent work with, with uh, Juan Davila, Monica Musso, and Jun Chen Wei in 2022. And um, the limiting helix is this guy, which is uh, what you expect, the solution of the binormal flow. So in the axisymmetric case with Noswell, the, the equation takes the form is again reduced to a scalar problem, which is this one, yeah? And if we scale time uh, logarithmically as we did before, Frankel found and other people have found the solutions which are traveling um, rings, huh? vortex rings, what they are called. Many people have worked on them. And uh, a question, for the, uh, we will conclude with this, the, is the, what happens with the interaction of multiple vortex rings? This is the problem very interesting called the leapfrogging vortex rings. Helmholtz in 1858 predicted this type of motion. So uh, these um, vortex rings alternate, say are, are going after one each other, okay? They cross moving their radii and, and, and then doing that periodically. In fact, for at least a finite number of times. We're able to find solutions with that particular ansatz, okay? Uh, with that particular form. And this is, uh, and this can be mathematically expressed in this way. So this is a conjecture probably that traces back to mid 19th century. If you start with the solution of this form for the, for the centers, okay? Of the radii of the rings, then you end up having a solution of this form as one would expect. Okay, so in, in other words, if you take any, any periodic solution, 
associated to this problem. This is the phase plane. You are uh, end up with the uh, correspondingly flowing motion. Okay, so uh, I stop here. So thank you very much for your attention. Let's thank the speaker. Questions, comments, remarks? Manuel, uh, could you return to uh, 2D? To the 2D case, okay? Yeah. Uh, 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 to, no, at the end of 2D. Sorry? At the end of a 2D case. Yeah, the uh, end. You, yeah, the end. Uh, you had there a very strange constant, uh, dot uh, 937. Uh, what is this? Ah, you mean the you mean for the surface quasi geostrophic, huh? Yeah. For the fractional case, this one. Yes. Huh? Yes, yes. Sorry, I didn't I didn't I, I didn't say where the problem was. You mean you mean why? Huh? Why this number? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, the reason the, is uh, highly technical. The the actual actually the, this quadratic this uh, this this estimate for that that I mentioned uh, so before. It, for the it is a numerical constant, uh, some numerical constant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it, it is some numerical Seven. constant. Uh, a solution of some algebraic equation. Huh? Mm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, more questions? Yes. Uh, could you please repeat how the parameter epsilon is introduced for the first time? Yes, uh, let me. Uh... It's a regularizing parameter, right? And how is it introduced? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I have problems with the sound. Could you please repeat? Gromche, uh, Excuse me, once again. Uh, how is the parameter epsilon is introduced for the first time? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, essentially the point is to consider initial conditions. Initial conditions for the equation. I mean, the problem is this, right? The original problem is this. If you wish the parameter epsilon is part of the initial condition. No? So you can see yes, the initial how is it introduced? Could you, please, uh, could you please show? Yes, so it is introduced as a, as a parameter in the initial condition in this form. So in, in, the, in, this, um, in this particular regularizations that I am choosing, yeah? So I am simply regularizing this, this bubble that, that has this decay using scaling simply the, the, the X, dividing it by epsilon and multiplying it by this factor to preserve the mass. So that's the, so this is, the, I, want, I want a solution that at main order looks like this, like, excuse like this me, guy. Excuse me, excuse me. Uh, the idea is the following. The parameter epsilon Epsilon is a kind of regularizing parameter, right? Exactly. And uh, maybe it makes sense. Uh, how, uh, does it have some physical meaning? I mean, maybe you should uh, use another regularization like introducing absorption or viscosity, something like this. Uh, use, yes, use something, to use something like limit absorption principles or something like this. There, this is, uh, I mean, this is true. Uh, on the other hand, I am, I am actually, I care now about sol solving Euler. So what you mean is, well, perhaps I could have introduced a viscosity and then I get, uh, and, and get a solution more or less of this form. It is true that you could find that, but you have also to, to introduce the high concentration in the initial conditions anyways. No? So, so I, I, I don't know if I, am, if, if I am understanding the question correctly. So you mean, why are we choosing this way of regularizing the problem? Well, I am, the problem is actually solving Euler. So what I am doing is solving Euler, not, not regularizing it. I, I am solving the equation. 
Hmm? The other, the solution with Dirac deltas is a, is a limiting singular object. So it's not a solution. It's not a true solution. Okay, thank you. More questions? If not the case, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Okay, our morning.